Good morning, Montview Church. A special welcome to those of you who are first time worshipers with us, who are guests here today. We're so glad you're here. For those of you who are worshiping with us online uh, through live stream, we are so glad you are worshiping with us in your homes. Today is a full day, a full morning in worship. We have the bells in the house, which is uh, wonderful. We have baptisms. We have two baptisms. We have new members joining, I think 17 new members. So there's a lot of good things going on. I also want to um, welcome the Reverend Nadia Bulls Weber. Um, Nadia is a friend of Montview's. We call her a re resident theologian. She is a pastor of public witness in the uh, Rocky Mountain Synod, the uh, ELCA, the Lutheran Synod. She is also in covenant, so with Montview Church, with St. John's, the cathedral, and also with New Beginnings Worshiping Community in the Women's Correctional um, Institution. She does a lot of wonderful things. She's an outstanding preacher, and we're so glad that she is in the pulpit today. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and join us in the call to worship. We walk the road to Jerusalem. It will require that we give up so much. With grateful hearts, we journey together. Amen. This is the first Sunday of the season of Lent, a season that invites us to become more of who we already are. We are beloved children of God, and Jesus invites us to release our anxieties and our fears, to let go of our resentments and our self-loathing, to trust that the Spirit cuts through our evasions of truth so that we might follow unencumbered. With honesty, let us bring our whole selves to God in confession. Merciful God, as we walk this Lenten journey, give us the sincerity to speak the truth of both our beauty and our brokenness. Remind us that we are made in your image and forgive us when we forget the image, hungering instead for that which does not satisfy, clinging to that which does not give life, ignoring those who need our love. And in your mercy, give us renewal, reparation, resurrection. Amen. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and set free. Believe that. It is good news. Receive the good news, forgive yourselves, and forgive others, and live in peace. Amen.
We are ambassadors of peace in the name of Jesus Christ. So turn to one another and share the peace of God. The peace of the Lord be with you. everyone is so wonderful to be with you today so last week there was a special day it was called Ash Wednesday and Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the church season of Lent Lent is a time when we wait and prepare for Holy Week and Easter purple is the color for the season of Lent and we're surrounded by purple right now. Look behind us. There's purple on the pyramid on the Lord's table and the co-pastor's stoles and Reverend Bolt's weather's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> there are purple pyramids on the lectern, that's what that side is called, and on the pulpit, that side. So Lent is a time when we think about what Jesus said and did. We think about the stories that he told. All of them help us know God's way of being in the world, God's way of love. And one of the stories he told included lamps like this one. The lamps in the story were bigger because this is a toy, but for this, lamp to shine in the world and add light to the world, you have to remember to put oil in that center space. 
see it? It's sort of like us. We shine more brightly in the world, and we add more light to the world when we remember some things. It's not about oil, but it's about being kind and sharing and taking turns and including people. It's about saying, I'm sorry, when we need to, and saying, I forgive you when we need to. If you think those things are important, will you show me a thumbs up? How about all of you? If you think those things are important, oh, look, everyone thinks those things are important. They help us to live in God's way of love. Let's pray together now. We're going to fold our hands, close our eyes, and bow our heads, and we'll all say amen together at the end. Dear God, we give you thanks for this season of Lent. We thank you for this time when we can think about what Jesus said and did. We can think about the stories he told as he taught us your way of love. God, please help us to live in this way each day. We pray in the name of Jesus, and we all say together, Amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. At this time, I invite those who present themselves for baptism to come on up. children of the covenant, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Sisters and brothers in Christ, in baptism, God claims us, seals us with water to show that we belong to God. Uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, God frees us from sin and from death. And by water and the Holy Spirit, we are welcomed into Christ's church. So let us remember with joy our own baptisms. Suzanne and John, Kate and Ian, do you desire that your children be baptized? If so, please say, we do. And relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your children? If so, please say, we do. To our sponsors, our friends and family, and that inner circle, this question is for you. Do you promise through prayer and example to support and encourage Gabriel and Miles to be faithful Christians? If so, please say we do. We do. Do we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Gabriel and Miles by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his church? If so, please answer, we do. Would you please stand as you are able as we confess our faith printed in your bulletin. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. We trust in the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life, with believers in every time and place. We rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, throughout history, you have nourished and sustained all living things through the gift of water. 
From the time of creation to your own baptism in the waters of the Jordan, to this moment, you invite us into loving relationship with you. We thank you for the gift of life and for the gift of Gabrielle and Miles. As they are marked with this water, seal them with your covenant, of your covenant of presence and grace. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them and upon these waters that this font may be the womb of new birth, giving them the power to do your will and live forever the risen life in Christ. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Kate and Ian, what is the Christian name of this child? Miles, do you want to touch that water? Miles, Logan, I baptize you in the name of God the Creator, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Spirit. Miles, you are a child of God, adopted and sealed as God's own forever. May God bless you today and always. Amen. There's a little more. There you go. (laughs) And what is the Christian name of this child? Gabrielle Ruth. Hi, Gabrielle. Gabrielle Ruth, I baptize you. In the name of God the Creator, and God the Son, (laughs) and God the Holy Spirit. For you, my dear, are a child of God, and you always will be. (laughs) Thanks be to God. The names of Gabrielle Ruth Caverly and Miles Logan Theme are now inscribed in the Book of the Church, together with all our names. Let us remember with joy that God is the giver of all life and knows each of us by name. This candle represents the new life in Christ. It is to be entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. May Gabrielle and Miles and all who have received this sacrament walk as children of the light, and may God keep the flame of faith alive in us forever. Friends, see what great love God has for us, that we too are called children of God. Amen. Amen.
Please join me in saying our prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. Lord, may your holy word be for us the seed of new possibilities that blossoms in ways we cannot yet imagine. Amen. Good, mo good morning. Our reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, versions one, v verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will, be, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other young woman came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Listen to the voice of the Spirit speaking to the church. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from the triune God. Amen. I'm not sure about you, but to me, the parable of the foolish bridesmaid sounds almost exactly like an anxiety dream I'd wake up from in a panic. It feels like Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a bad dream where I'm supposed to go pick someone up and someone important up from the airport, like Dolly Parton, but I forget to fill my gas tank and then I'm idling outside baggage claim for so long I doze off and then when Dolly Parton finally texts, she's almost there. My car starts beeping that it's nearly out of gas, but then I realize the dude in front of me has a gas can strapped in the back of his mom monster truck, and I ask if he can help me, but he just aggressively points to the overpriced gas station outside the airport, and in a panic, I use the fumes in my tank to get there, but then when I'm filling up my Subaru, I see Dolly Parton drive off in the passenger side of that dude's F-150, and she doesn't even return my wave like she doesn't know me. So, you know, stay alert, because the kingdom of heaven's like that. <clears throat> so, uh, what exactly are we to take from this parable? That we should not rely on others? That we should not give to those who ask of us? I mean, that would be weird, wouldn't it, if Jesus just suddenly took back everything he said about generosity and self-giving and instead gave us this little parable about how we should be stingy and self-reliant. I mean, if you're thinking this parable doesn't sound exactly like most of the other stuff that Jesus said, uh, you're not alone. I mean, like, here's three other verses from the exact same gospel. Uh, give to everyone who begs from you, 
and do not re refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Uh, and then 19th chapter, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. And the 23rd chapter, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. I mean, given all of that, what could possibly be the moral of the story in this parable of the foolish bridesmaids? And that, my friends, that assumption that it's our job to find the moral instruction in these texts is what I like to call the parable trap. Welcome to it. See, there are many things you can do with a parable. You can meditate on Jesus' parables. You can struggle with them, you can enter into them, you can speak of them. But the very best way to suck the life out of a parable is by attempting to figure out the so-called moral of the story. Because parables aren't about morals. Parables are about truth. Hidden, unyielding, disruptive truth. And not to put too fine a point on it, but Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Interestingly enough, he did not say you will know the morals and the morals will set you free. So I insist on finding some truth in this parable that's maybe just slightly more nuanced than some kind of Boy Scout sentiment about always being prepared. I insist on digging in to find the good news that Jesus has hidden for us in this parable of the 10 bridesmaids. And the reason I insist on finding good news is I need some good news right now. I'm actually kind of desperate for it. I want a truth that sets me free because I've tried half truths and fake news and they just leave me wanting to up my meds. <laughs> so my friends, some texts we must wrestle with. They will not hand over the goods quite so easily. And sometimes the way to find the good news in a text is to use the rest of scripture as like a secret decoder ring. So I promise you that when read alongside the Garden of Eden and the feeding of the 5,000 and a lovely little verse in Revelation, the parable of the foolish bridesmaids absolutely shines with good news. So here we go. Years ago, when I was still in my parish, uh, a parishioner of mine posted something on Facebook. It was a Saturday afternoon, and she posted something very short. It just said, I just saw a really big snake on my hike. And I replied, as your pastor, I feel like I should say, if the snake starts talking, don't listen. If you remember, things started really unraveling for us the first time we listened to a snake, which I now consider to be the world's first Instagram influencer. <laughs> when Adam and Eve were in the garden, we are told that they were naked and unashamed until they listened to a snake, until they listened to a voice other than God's tell them who they were and what they really needed. And then they believed that voice more than they believed God's voice, and they went for it. They like totally clicked on the link, you know? And uh, as a result, they were filled with shame for the very first time, and they tried to hide from God. And then, if you remember, God calls out, and he goes, hey, where are you guys? And they say, we're naked, and we're ashamed, and we're afraid of you. And God goes, hold on. Who told you you were naked? Who told them they were naked? My money has always been on the snake for that one. Which brings me back to the bridesmaids. I don't think that the foolish bridesmaids were foolish because they didn't bring extra oil or because they fell asleep. The wise ones fell asleep too. I think they were foolish for listening to the other bridesmaids tell them what to do, and they were certainly foolish for doing it. I think they were foolish, in other words, in the exact same way that we are foolish. 
They were foolish because they listened when voices other than God's tried to tell them who they were, and they listened to those whispering voices telling them that they can only approach the groom if they have already met all of their own needs first. And here's what really got me this week as I studied this text. It was, a re it was reading this verse from Revelation 22, which says, in the city of God, they will not need the light of a lamp, for the Lord will give them light. I mean, think about it. If at midnight, the guy who was on watch said, hey, wake up, the groom's coming. The groom must have had a lamp or a torch of some kind, right? How else could the groom have been seen from that far away at midnight? The foolish bridesmaids weren't foolish because they didn't bring backup oil. They were foolish because instead of trusting that the light of Christ was enough to shine the way, they wasted all that time and energy and money trying to get their own because someone shamed them into thinking that they could never approach the Lord with their lack. Rather than just trusting that the light of those around them and that the light of Christ was enough, they assumed they had to provide their own. And then they were so consumed by the shame of not being enough, they busied themselves trying to fix it. So much so that they missed the wedding banquet. They missed everything. Of course the bridegroom said, I don't know you because they hadn't come to him in their need and in their lack and in their want. Because Jesus knows us not by our independence from him, Jesus knows us by our need of him, for which we should never feel ashamed. They, perhaps not unlike us, mistakenly assumed that all God is interested in is their strength and preparedness and goodness, when what really God asks of us is to just know our need of him. Which brings me to the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus asked the disciples what they have with them to feed the crowd, do you remember? He said, what do you have? And they said, nothing. Nothing but like couple loaves and a few fish. And they said it like it was a problem. But do we not have a God who created the universe out of nothing, that could put flesh on the dry bones of nothing, that can put life in a dusty womb of nothing? I mean, let's face it, nothing is like God's favorite raw material to work with. <laughs> Perhaps God looks upon that which we dismiss as nothing or insignificant or worthless and says, finally, now that I can do something with. So my sweet friends, all that is to say, the kingdom of heaven is not like an existential anxiety dream. Maybe you're sitting here today having listened to a voice other than God's. And maybe the story it told you is so familiar that you think it's the truth. But consider that maybe you've been listening to the wrong voices all along. Listen and maybe you can hear God saying, hold on, who told you you were naked? Who told you that you have to lie to be loved? Who told you that your body isn't beautiful? Who told you that your only value is in your excellence? Who told you that what you have done, good or bad, is actually who you are? Who told you that? My money's on the snake, and he's a damn liar, and always has been. So when snakes and bridesmaids start talking blasphemy, don't listen. You don't have to show up with everything you need. The light of Christ is bright enough to light our way, and it always has been. Amen.
The following people have been received by the session into the membership of our congregation. Um, as I begin to call the names, I'll invite you to just start coming forward and join us here. Bill Dobrennan. All of you just come on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Deborah Dobrennan. Nina Front. Jeannie Lee. Jennifer DeJong. Cindy Oaks, Terry Oaks, Andrew Walvard, Norm Potoff, Rose Potoff, Patricia Summerhill, Kate Thiem, Carol Van Story, Lisa Walvard, Katie Weber, Robert Yakeley, and Rosemary Yakeley. This is a good crowd, would you not say? <laughs> Friends, as you affirm your intention to begin this relationship and journey with this community of faith and profess your baptismal vows, please answer the following questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, do you? And do you turn to Jesus Christ and trust him as your Lord and Savior, accepting his forgiveness of sin and trusting in his grace and love? Do you? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and your gifts, your study and your service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, will you? Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be your faithful people. You are a faithful God. You work in us and for us and for us even when we do not know it. When our path has led us away from you, you guide us back to yourself. Now by your Spirit, strengthen all those standing here before you in faith and love, that they may be, serve you with joy and thanksgiving. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. And with the whole church, would you please stand as you are able and let us together affirm our faith. In life, life and, and in death, death we, we belong, belong to God. God. Through the, the grace, grace of our, our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. We trust in the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Creator and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our, our Creator, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And friends, we give thanks to God for each of you. Welcome to the worship and the work of Montview Church. And may the grace and the peace of Christ be with you now and all of your days. Amen. Amen.
You know, most Sundays when we have this moment where we talk about stewardship and generosity in the world, um, we think about giving because we have been given so much. And it's, it's often this idea that out of our abundance that we give, that we can be generous. Nadia's sermon this morning reminded me that often, actually, when I feel most generous, it's not because I feel that I have so much. It's out of that recognition of my own lack of what I don't have and knowing that we all are in the same boat together, that we all experience brothers and sisters wherever we are in our life, that sense of lack, and it's out of that sense that compels me to be generous. So today, um, as we reflect on giving, get in touch with not your abundance, but your sense of need and your sense of connection to others through that need. As you're able in body or spirit, would you stand for our prayer of dedication? God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works, a continual thank offering to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our prayer continues. Thanks be to you, O God, for this precious life, for the excessive beauty and the bounty of it all, for the hope of spring and your holy breath in our lungs, for those who love us in spite of our faults and the sweet release it is to be forgiven. For the deep and complex ties of family and the blessedly uncomplicated kindness of strangers. Thanks be to you, O God, for this Lenten journey, for the ways you nudge and pester and provoke us to open our hearts and to live more bravely the ways you disturb our sleep with your dreams of a more beloved community, the ways you light fires in our hearts to overcome hatred with insistent, relentless, and stubborn love. We pray this day for the people of Turkey, of El Salvador, of Ukraine and Russia. We pray for our Jewish sisters and brothers and all those targeted for hate crimes. We pray for those who live in fear for their lives, for the desperate and the despairing, for those on the run, for whatever reason. May they and may we, no matter how lonely or far from a sense of home we may feel, know the presence of your love and moments of deep peace for you remain our rock and our redeemer, the keeper of our hearts and the source of our strength. And in the name of the one who came to bring life and life abundant, we humbly pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand in body or spirit for our closing hymn? this week when you hear a voice, a voice that is telling you to be afraid or to be critical or to be judgmental, quiet that voice and open yourself to the voice of God who says, come to me in all your emptiness with your need and your lack. Now may the grace of God and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.